come to you today from Moraga, California. We're on the campus of St. Mary's College. This is the West Coast Conference this week. It is presented by GEICO. And hello again, everybody. I'm Barry Tompkins. My partner, Casey Jacobson, 13 years ago, there was a guy who was a shooting guard at Stanford and a darn good one came over to me and said, you know, I want to do what you do one of these days. I told him, you're going to take my job. I still believe that. A pleasure to tee it up after all this time with Casey. Casey, what goes around comes around. Yeah, I've been waiting for this moment for a very long time, Barry, to get a, to work a game with you. It's an honor. And I still say he'll take my job. <laughs> no. Let's talk about this conference. We're going to be watching the West Coast Conference every week now for the next 10 weeks. It was a very good conference last week, last year, I should yeah. say. If anything, it's a better conference this year. Yeah, it was a great conference last year. You know, they had six teams that played in the postseason, two of which played in the NCAA tournament, BYU and Gonzaga. BYU lost to a good Oregon team in their first game, but th remember they lost Kyle Collinsworth, a big part of their team. Gonzaga, on the other hand, did win a first round game against Oklahoma State before losing to a very deep Arizona team. But this is the third year in a row that the WCC has had multiple bids to the NCAA tourney. Yeah, and a very successful preseason for the conference in general. Just two teams sub 500. Here is the way things stand as we head in to conference play. Gonzaga, of course, the only loss, that overtime loss, in a very winnable game for them in Arizona. Tough place to play, of course. We talked about BYU. How about Portland, 9-3? and three? How about Pacific, where your brother yeah. coaches, 8-4? and four. As we said, just two sub-500 teams. This is a tough conference. It's a very tough conference. Uh, eight of the ten teams come into this game with winning records. But, Barry, we have to talk more about Gonzaga. This might be Mark Few's best team that he's ever had. And I know they had a very good team several years ago with Kelly Olenek and Elias Harris. But this year's team might be as deep as he's ever had. I expect them to go very deep in the tournament, possibly Final Four. All right, so every coach you talk to in the West Coast Conference says how tough this conference is. We, of course, had a moment to talk to Randy Bennett, the coach here at St. Mary's. And you know what he said? You guessed it. Here's Randy. I think the conference is up. I, don't, I think everybody's got pretty good players, pretty good team. I think overall our, our uh, non-conference records are pretty good. Uh, obviously Gonzaga's way out there. And, uh, but there's other good teams. I think BYU's good, St. USF for these guys. I mean, Loyal had a good win of the day. Pepperdine's a good start, Portland. Anyhow, it's, uh, it's, it's good. You know what really is interesting about this conference to me, and I think what makes it so tough, Casey, is the fact almost everybody's got at least one good big, and some teams have two. And there's also some really solid backcourts. When you got that combination, you're going to be pretty good. There's all kinds of stars in the WCC. There are four WCC players who are in the top 25 nationally in scoring. We've got to start with Tyler Hawes, BYU. No one can figure out how to stop this guy from getting buckets. Evan Payne at LMU. LMU's in a rebuilding project, but he's as ex as explosive a backcourt player as you'll find. We got one here tonight. St. Mary's Brad Waldo's putting up 22 points and 11 rebounds. Those numbers are outrageous. And then of course, Johnny D at San Diego is trying to become their school's best all-time scorer. A lot of stars. Yeah, Love the it. conference is loaded. There's no question about it. We're going to be with you, as we said, every week for the next 10 weeks. We're going to jump off the track right now, but when we come back, we're going to go back to the studio. Peter McGee and Dave Miller are going to bring you up to date on everything West Coast Conference. Don't go away. Hello and welcome back to the GEICO WCC this week in Los Angeles. I'm Chris McGee. Joining me, former NBA assistant coach Dave Miller. First show of the year, an exciting time. Coach, what's your initial impression of the WCC and the non-conference season? Well, Chris, if you like offense, this is the league for you. Right now, nationally, the WCC leads college basketball in three-point field goal percentage. They're fourth in the nation in overall scoring, and they're third in field goal percentage. These guys make buckets, whether it's from the three, whether it's in transition like BYU. They're just fun to watch, and it's a great league of student athletes that there is life after basketball. Love making buckets. All right, let's take a quick look at what the three WCC superpowers have accomplished so far. First up, Gonzaga, the Bulldogs, have just one loss so far, an overtime thriller against Arizona, and they are ranked number eight nationally. They're shooting close to 54% from the field. That's second in the nation. Gonzaga has won 13 of the last 14 WCC titles, and they're going to be tough to beat again this year with their senior guards, Kevin Pangos and Gary Bell and some new stars in the front court. Now, BYU, 
started off 10 and 3, including a nice win over Stanford last Saturday. Once again, they really pushed the pace, leading the nation in scoring at 88 points per game. They've scored 90 or more seven times already this season. And of course, it all starts with Tyler Haas, who's fifth in the nation in scoring at 22 points per game. But don't forget about the versatile Kyle Collinsworth, who's fourth in the WCC in rebounds and fifth in assists. And St. Mary's has started 7-3 with a nice win at Creighton as well as a close loss at St. John's. All WCC center Brad Waldo averages a double-double, leading the league in rebounding and second in scoring. The Gales also have some impact transfers with Aaron Bright from Stanford and Desmond Simmons from Washington. St. Mary's is trying to make their way back into the NCAA tournament after going to the NIT last season. And here's what the non-conference standings look like. And Zaga is, of course, at the top, followed by BYU and Portland. Only two teams are under 500, and no team has lost more than two games at home. It's going to be an interesting race this year. Coach, uh, we saw some of Gonzaga's early season accomplishments. You watched him against Arizona. How good is this team? Well, this is a team that I think is the most balanced Zag team that I've seen in a while. And when you look at the wings, it starts with athleticism. You've got Wesley. You've got Kyle Draginis. You've got Angel Nunez that can play. And then when you think about shooters, it really starts with Pangos and Bell. And what I like about this team the most, they've got big-time size. Karnowski, Sabonis, Wilcher. This is a team that reminds me of the San Antonio Spurs. They can play with pace. They execute in the half court. They can shoot threes. They share the basketball and they make the right plays. And I love there's a method to their madness. They get the ball inside before they start looking for those perimeter jumpers. Coach, I know this usually isn't your gig. I mean, coaches don't like to think about this kind of stuff. But right now, you got to make predictions, all right, right before the conference season starts. Who will be the player of the year? Well, I think it goes to the reigning WC Player yep. of the Year, Tyler Hawes from BYU. And when you think about this guy, he can score from anywhere on the floor. He's averaging a league best 22 points per game. He can catch and shoot off the bounce. He reads screens as well as anybody in the country. To me, he plays like a poor man's Danny Age. I love his grit. I love his ability to create space. And when he's got the ball in his hands, you can almost count on a bucket. But he also moves well without the basketball. Here's a guy that knows how to move with a purpose, yeah. and he really is is quite the, the player. All right, what about coach of the year? There he is. Well, I think Reveno and Marty Wilson caught my eye from strong starts, but to me it's about Mark Few. This might not be his best team, but it's his most coachable. I've seen Sabonis improve. Wesley was a one-dimensional player at USC. Now he transfers there, and you see him sharing the ball, yeah. moving the ball. I'm seeing some real coaching early. Few should win it. I mean, he's won 13 of the last – 14 regular season WCC titles. I always like this one. Newcomer of the year. I got to go with the Zags. Again, I got to go with Wiltshire, the 6'10 mm. transfer from Kentucky. He can stretch it to three. He's skilled in the post. He can face you up. He's got a turnaround jump shot over either shoulder. And I know this is going to surprise a lot of people, but watching him play at UCLA, he reminded me of a poor man's Dirk Nowitzki. I think he's extremely talented. He can hit those shots facing up. Now, obviously, I don't think he's set for the Hall of Fame, but this is a kid <laughs> that is really going to surprise the West Coast Conference. Speaking of surprises, give me a surprise team. Good question. I'd have to go with Portland, and I, I start that a year ago because they lost to the 10th seed LMU in the WCC tournament. They lost my man Ryan Nichols, who was a double-double guy, but Thomas Vandermars is anchoring the point. They've got quick guards. They execute. Plus, they've got the mental toughness of their coach. No one on the West Coast thought this team, Chris, was going to be 9-3 entering league play. I like their transition. I like they the way they execute in the half court. This is an extremely well-coached team. And Revenal needs to make a push to try and get into the upper half of this league. You know, we like to push ourselves here. So we like to do new things. And it's time for a new segment on WCC this week. We had some of the WCC coaches in our studio earlier this year. And you had some fun with them, Coach. Uh, let's go coach versus coach with Santa Clara's Carrie Keating. Coach, you're on the hot seat. It's coach versus coach. All right. Best player you've ever coached. Wow. Had a lot of great ones. Uh, the most recent that come to mind, probably uh, at Santa Clara, John Bryant. Best, best player in the WCC. Well, the rainy guy's Tyler. So until uh, someone unseats him, I think he's got, he's got the, uh, the moniker for now. Toughest place to play in the conference away from Santa Clara. 
Well, gosh, if I didn't say Gonzaga, I think you'd have to check my check my head. It's uh, <laughs> it is what it is. It's the toughest place for now. What's your favorite non basketball activity? I used to be golf. Now it's my kids. Favorite person to follow on Twitter? Gosh, a lot of them. You know who I actually like is Darren Ravel. I think he, he comes up with some interesting. You and tips. Kobe Bryant. Yeah, I like it. Dead or alive, one person you could have lunch with. Oh wow, that's a great question. Doesn't get posed often. I'd probably say JFK. What superstitions do you have game day? I used to have a lot more. My staff and my team are working me out of them. I was a time, time, time guy. Now I'm just all about the positive energy. So away from the superstition, more towards the positive energy. If you had one superpower, what would it be? To cover ground quickly so I could teach our guys how to play health defense effectively. Biggie or Tupac? <laughs> oh, see, I'm an I'm a East Coast guy at heart, so I got to say, I got to say Biggie. So you're thinking the east side is the best side? Well, see, I'm 12 years in the – I got to both – I'm now. from Allentown, PA. I live here for 18 years. West side? Got to stay true to the east coast, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you had a lot of fun with those coaches. That was a WCC Media Day. It's fun to see them open up a little bit. It is because we just see them stalking the sidelines. But whether it's <laughs> Kerry Keating, whether it's Randy Bennett, whether it's Bill Greer, these are not only great coaches, they're great teachers, and more importantly, they're role models for the student athletes that they coach in this conference. Because again, the goals in the WCC for these yep. coaches, it's to win. But they're also higher than yep. 10 feet. It's life after basketball because these guys graduate and go on to do great things. Loved how Coach tried to play both sides, east and west. That was great, Coach. All right, coming up next on WCC this week, the story of a courageous Santa Clara player on his way to recovery from brain surgery. Stay tuned. The GEICO WCC Player of the Week for last week is junior guard Delani Robinson of Pacific. He hit the game-winning three-pointer against Fresno State with 1.1 seconds left. He also scored the final eight points for the Tigers in a four-point win over Nevada for the week. He averaged 11 and a half points and four assists. It had been a long journey for Andrew Pappenfuss to make the team at Santa Clara. He was a manager and a practice player. He left Santa Clara and he came back. But when he finally made it last season, Andrew faced an unexpected obstacle and had nothing to do with his basketball. His journey to get back on the court this time has been even more impressive. Amanda Blackwell has a story. The first time Andrew Pappenfuss played in a game for Santa Clara University, he had just won an uphill battle. Brandy Clark to Andrew Pappenfuss oh, who lays it in. Pappenfuss began his college career as a team manager for the Broncos before transferring to play Division II ball and then returning to Santa Clara to play on the practice squad. Last season as a junior, he finally received the jersey he had been coveting. I had a dream coming out of high school that I wanted to play Division I basketball. Just never given up, worked hard in the weight room, worked hard you know, whenever I, I had a chance to and you know, eventually earned, earned a spot on the team. Just finally getting there, you know, it's just like, ah, you know, I made it. But you know, once, once I made it, you know, I've never given up. You know, I always have a new goal. He was in position to head into his senior season as a team captain and leader. Wall Nate, Wall Nate, Wall Nate! But over the summer, while coaching a youth camp, the unthinkable happened. I was, you know, demonstrating a drill, and for some reason I kind of felt weird. I went to shoot a, a, a corner three, I airballed it, and I was just like, man, this is weird. And all of a sudden it felt like I pulled my hamstring, and I, I kind of just fell over. And then I could feel my body start to kind of convulse, and I was just like, I think I'm going to have a seizure. I blacked out. I don't remember anything. It felt like I was light speed running down the stairs to, to get there, and by the time I had gotten there, he was about halfway through the two-minute seizure. And from that point on, it, kind of felt like weeks or days till we got from one point to another, the ride to the hospital and just trying to ascertain what had happened to him and trying to keep him calm to understand that we'll figure it out. Pappenfuss was diagnosed with a grade two astrocytoma, a tumor near the part of his brain that controls the right side of his body. Because it was slow growing, the doctors told him he could either have it removed right away or wait until after the season was over. I thought I was going to play. You know, at first I made the decision, you know, I'm going to push it back. I've worked so hard, you know, to be here in my senior year to actually earn minutes. And then it probably took a month of just kind of reflecting day in, day out. And then one day I just, it just kind of came to me. My health long term is, is more important than one year of basketball. The night before the surgery, Pappenfuss visited his teammates, who helped give him the strength he needed. 
I was just telling them, uh, don't worry about it, everything's gonna be okay. Uh, you're a fighter already, so I already know that it's gonna go well. All the positive support, you know, you're gonna be fine. You know, we're praying for you, this, that, it just really, you know, gave me the strength and the ability not to worry just because I knew so many people were there. The surgery was a five hour long process and Papenfuss was awake for most of the time so that the surgeons could be sure they hadn't affected his ability to move. They'd stimulate my brain with electricity to see if they could get my foot or my arm to move. It caused me to have a, a little mini seizure at first and how they stopped it is that they poured cold water on my brain. Uh, but it actually felt like they were pouring cold water on my leg. It was just it was quite a you know, crazy sensation. The surgery was successful, and the next few days were filled with family and friends visiting him in the hospital, and already Papenfuss was starting to feel more like himself again. He's still kind of out of it, but he's still kind of joking around. He's talking to the nurse and stuff, so it was kind of like positive and happy energy around the room. Right away, he just started talking about what, what are we going to do next now? Well, what can I do next? I mean, when do I get to physical therapy? When when can I get back on the court? He felt like he was already winning just by having it removed successfully. Once again, Papenfuss is working towards a goal of playing in a game for the Santa Clara Broncos. He's not ready for action just yet, but he's back out on the floor with his team, which is a great first step. I just wanted to try and get back to you know my normal routine just to, to help me through the process. So you know that was my goal is to try and get back out on the court. It doesn't really surprise me because that's you know how Andrew is. He's a persistent hard worker, you know, and he loves the game. That's what he wants to do. Doctors initially told Papenfus he could begin practicing with contact three months after his surgery, which would fall on January 6th. It's not certain he'll be ready for that date just yet, but when he does step back on the court, it will be pure joy for the Broncos. I want to see him. I don't care if it's the last game or whatever it is. I just want to see him step foot on that court, and I know it'll be special for him, and I know it'll be special for our whole team. Resilience is probably the easiest word to pick, but the, there's something more that Andrew has that has gotten him to this point to have a chance to actually be back. I love the competitiveness of basketball. I just love the game, so um, having it kind of taken away from you, especially my path, you know, you've worked so hard to finally kind of make it at that level, be able to contribute not only off the court, but you know, now being able to, to get minutes and whatever, it's been hard. So just being able to, to know that I've overcome something so life-changing, it's gonna be joyous. For the WCC this week, I'm Amanda Blackwell. Great story, Amanda. Everyone is rooting for Andrew to get back on the court. Let's take a look at Santa Clara so far this season. They've started off five and six, losing their last two games. They have a pair of guards, Brandon Clark and Jared Brownridge, who can really score the ball, each averaging 16 points per game. All right, game of the week, Coach Santa Clara at St. Mary's. What interests you in this game? Well, you were just talking about guards, and that's what interests me, because when you think of Santa Clara, the strength of this team is in Jared Brownridge and Brandon Clark. They're two dynamic guards. But on the other side, you've got three really good guards for Randy Bennett. When you look at Emmett Narr, I think he could be a long shot to be an NBA backup point guard in the league. You've also got the transfer Aaron Bright that comes in as a grad, and then you're also looking at Kerry Carter. But the key to this game is going to be points in the paint, and we're going to see the bigs are going to have to the battle. We know with St. Mary's it all starts with Brad Waldo. They're also going to have to find a way to stop Desmond Simmons because he's big on offensive rebounds. And then they've also got a big Pinot who's a little bit more finesse but can get inside. But it comes down to can Santa Clara, can Atanga and Cratch can they defend inside? That's where it's going to come down to. If they can neutralize mm -hmm. the bigs, then they're going to have a fighting chance. But St. Mary's on the road they win in double digits. It, it, it looks like St. Mary's is back after a year going to the NIT. Never count out Randy yeah. Bennett because they're always going to defend. They're always going to rebound. And you know from past history, their guards really play. But St. Mary's will go as far as Brad Waldo takes him. He's yeah, got to be beast. their beast in the paint offensively and defensively. And at home, they can't afford to lose any games all season. Coach Dave Miller crushing it. I'm Chris McGee. We'll get you back to McKeon Pavilion in Moraga, California.